for eight relentless days, six young boys, mere teenagers, faced the unforgiving fury of the Pacific Ocean. Clinging to the fragile hope of survival, they weathered ferocious waves and relentless storms, their boat teetering on the edge of ruin. Yet, the greatest challenge lay ahead. As fate would have it, their damaged craft ultimately succumbed to the treacherous embrace of rocky shores of Atta, marking the beginning of an even more extraordinary journey that would test their courage and resilience on this deserted island for the next 15 months. In June 1965, in the Kingdom of Tonga, on the island of Tonga Tapu, six teenagers at St. Andrew's College, a Catholic boarding school renowned for its rigorous discipline, yearned for a taste of freedom beyond the school's strict confines. This group of daring boys included Sione Fatawa, the eldest at 16, along with Stephen Fatailatu, Kolo Fekitoa, Sione Felipe Totao, and the youngest, David Tavita Siola, aged 13. These boys shared a common discontent toward the stringent rules enforced by the school's stern nuns. Fueled by a heady mix of teenage rebellion and a craving for excitement, the boys crafted their audacious escape plan. They aimed to sail to Fiji, or perhaps even New Zealand, yearning for a life less restricted. They chose Mr. Taniela Uhila's sturdy whaling boat for their bold escape, a boat belonging to a local fisherman whom they secretly resented for his stern demeanor. They gathered essential supplies, two sacks of bananas, a handful of coconuts, and a small gas burner. Naively confident, they could supplement these with fish caught en route. Confident in their nautical skills, as David's father owned a similar vessel on which they had sailed numerous times, they hoisted the sail with a mix of trepidation and excitement, whispering farewells to the island as they left the harbor, carried forward by a favorable wind. Yet in their youthful naivety, they overlooked the crucial need for a map or compass, grossly underestimating the enormity of their undertaking and the perils of the open sea. Their journey commenced in the early evening, their hearts buoyed by dreams of freedom. However, as night enveloped the sea, exhaustion crept in. Drained from the rigors of their school routine and the adrenaline of their clandestine departure, they succumbed to sleep, leaving the boat to the mercy of the ocean's whims. They were rudely awakened by a storm that seemed to materialize out of nowhere. Towering waves battered their small vessel, and howling winds shredded their sail and snapped the rudder. The boys, now gripped by fear and helplessness, faced the raw fury of nature. Panic set in. Some boys cried while others tried to rally their faith, masking their own creeping dread. But the storm's rage left them with few options. They were adrift, at the mercy of the vast Pacific. The storm raged through the night, an endless barrage of wind and waves. For eight harrowing days, the boys drifted in an unforgiving expanse of blue, their situation growing increasingly dire. Hunger gnawed at them, and thirst parched their throats. With no food or fresh water, their strength waned. They resorted to fishing, but their attempts were mostly futile. Rain brought brief respite, as they eagerly collected droplets in hollowed-out coconut shells, rationing this precious gift to a few sips each morning and evening. Their boat, now more a fragile raft than a sturdy vessel, seemed on the brink of succumbing to the relentless assault of the sea. On the ninth day, as hope dwindled to a mere flicker, salvation appeared on the horizon. Atta, a small deserted island, emerged from the vastness of the ocean. Its steep cliffs, rocky beaches, and surrounding coral reefs seemed like a haven from their ordeal. The boys' spirits soared at this sight. It was not just land, but a promise of survival. Upon reaching Atta, the boys were greeted by a rugged terrain of steep cliffs and rock-strewn beaches. The island had been uninhabited since 1863, after slavers evacuated it. Their arrival was anything but gentle. Their small fishing boat crashed violently against the island's shores, breaking apart on the unforgiving rocks. Bruised and cut, they staggered onto the island. Despite their exhaustion, there was a unanimous belief that Atta, with all its daunting wildness, was a haven compared to the merciless sea. Seeking shelter, they worked together to carve out a cave, a much-needed respite after their ordeal at sea. 
Leadership naturally emerged among the boys, with Sione and Steven stepping up to guide their survival efforts. Sione, with his pragmatic approach, took charge of practical survival strategies, while Steven provided emotional support and spiritual guidance, leading them in daily prayers for rescue. Despite their urban upbringing in Tonga's most populous city, the boys tapped into Sione's fragmented memories of his father's wilderness teachings, adapting as best they could to their new reality. They found a small cliff that offered a semblance of shelter and crafted makeshift beds beneath its overhang. In their quest for water, they hollowed out trees, patiently waiting for days to collect enough to quench their thirst. Driven by necessity, they scaled the island's cliffs to catch seabirds, not only for sustenance but also to drink their blood, a grim but vital source of hydration in the absence of sufficient water. Their diet was consumed entirely raw due to the absence of fire. Day after day, the boys tirelessly attempted to kindle a fire, rubbing sticks with the hope that friction would eventually birth flames. They understood its critical importance, not just for the warmth and cooked meals it would provide, but as a beacon of hope for potential rescue. Despite occasional quarrels stemming from their stressful situation, they established a unique system of conflict resolution. Any disagreement was followed by a mandatory four-hour separation, allowing time for solitary reflection in the jungle and emotional self-regulation, reaffirming their collective commitment to survival. Then, after six grueling months, their persistence paid off. The moment a fire finally ignited marked a profound shift in their spirits. It was a flicker of joy amidst relentless adversity. This fire became their lifeline, guarded zealously day and night to ensure it never died. The ability to cook their food and the symbolic warmth of the flames brought a semblance of comfort to their stark existence. In their continual adaptation to island life, the boys skillfully constructed a small shelter from leaves and branches. Central to their new abode was the fire, which they had meticulously moved inside for protection. This flame became a symbol of their perseverance. Not once did they allow it to extinguish, understanding its vital role in their survival. Hunting seabirds had become a daily necessity, with each boy tasked with capturing at least two birds daily to ensure sufficient food and hydration. Tragedy struck when Stephen, during one of their routine hunts, lost his footing and tumbled down the steep cliffs of Atta rugged terrain. The boys frantically searched and found him perched precariously on a narrow ledge, his leg broken. They carefully carried him back to their shelter, where they fashioned a makeshift splint from branches. Stephen's recovery became a collective responsibility. They tended to him diligently, ensuring he rested and healed and took over his chores until he could rejoin their efforts. Driven by hope and curiosity, the boys explored every corner of Atta. Their persistence led them to the peak of a flat-topped mountain, where they stumbled upon an incredible discovery, the ruins of an old village, abandoned since Captain McGrath's raid in 1863. Amidst the remnants, they found wild yucca, other vegetables, and, astonishingly, descendants of chickens left behind by the fleeing villagers. This discovery transformed their food situation. The boys engaged in games of capture the chickens, eventually corralling about 200 of them. They nurtured these chickens, feeding them coconut scraps, and relied on their eggs as a steady food source. Only in perilous weather recalling Stephen's accident would they resort to eating a chicken, opting to stay safe rather than risk another injury. As time wore on, the boys, driven by a fading hope of rescue, built a raft in an attempt to leave Atta. However, their plan was foiled when the raft disintegrated a mile offshore, forcing a demoralizing swim back to the island. Resignation set in after about a year. The boys began to accept the likelihood of spending their lives on Ata. They erected a more permanent shelter and revitalized the ancient vegetable gardens left by the villagers a century prior. Their daily routine was a disciplined mix of chores, tending the gardens, caring for the chickens, hunting, and maintaining the fire. They also committed to daily exercise, a vital routine to keep themselves physically and mentally fit, aware that bodily neglect could mean their demise. During one of their explorations, a somber discovery was made. The bones of one of the island's last inhabitants. In a poignant gesture of respect, the boys buried the remains, 
conducting a funeral service. They prayed for the departed soul and for themselves, hoping for rescue, not wanting to share the same forgotten fate. Yet, on the fateful day of September 11, 1996, a glimmer of hope finally appeared on the horizon for the castaway boys. As a ship neared their island, their hearts surged with a mix of disbelief and joy. Frantically, they screamed and waved, desperate to catch the attention of this potential savior. Stephen, in a burst of determination, plunged into the water, swimming with all his might toward the vessel. Meanwhile, aboard the ship, just David, Captain Peter Warner was concluding his own adventure. Peter, the youngest son of Arthur Warner, once Australia's most influential man, had strayed from the path expected of him. Rejecting a life of corporate success, he had instead pursued his dream of the sea, becoming a fisherman and now a captain. As Just David sailed home from Tonga, passing by Ata, a crewmate's report of a human voice caught Peter's attention. Initially skeptical, attributing it to seabirds, Peter's curiosity was piqued when they spotted unusual burn marks on the island. Such signs were rare in these parts and warranted investigation. He approached cautiously, mindful of stories about escaped convicts on nearby islands. These scorch marks were, of course, from the castaway boys. Once the boys were successful with one fire, they had started many more in the hopes of a nearby ship seeing them. On four occasions, ships passed by the island, but each time they had seen a ship, it had moved away before it got close enough to spot them. As Peter neared the island, a figure emerged from the dense foliage. The sight was startling. A boy, naked, long-haired, mud-covered, diving into the water and swimming determinedly toward the ship. Peter's initial apprehension grew. Tales of marooned criminals filled his mind, raising fears of a violent confrontation. However, what greeted him on board was far from his apprehensive imaginings. A disheveled but articulate teenager climbed aboard, introducing himself in perfect English. My name is Stephen. There are six of us, and we reckon we've been here for 15 months. Cautious but intrigued, Peter radioed the Tongan capital for confirmation. The operator's response was astonishing. Peter had found the lost boys, presumed dead for over a year. Back home, their families had mourned, holding funerals for sons they believed lost at sea. Upon their remarkable discovery, Captain Peter Warner and Stephen ventured back to Atta to retrieve the remaining boys. What Peter witnessed astounded him. The boys had not just survived. They had flourished in an environment where most teenagers, accustomed to the comforts of the 60s, would have faltered. These were no ordinary teens. Their upbringing in tropical Tonga had endowed them with skills exceptionally suited for island survival. Yet, the journey to normalcy was fraught with another unexpected hurdle. Upon their return, they faced legal repercussions for their impulsive theft of Mr. Taniela Uhila's boat. The fishermen, undeterred by their harrowing ordeal, pressed charges, resulting in their arrest and imprisonment. Peter, Moved by their plight and the boys' courage, devised a creative solution. He proposed to document their incredible survival tale, aiming to use the proceeds from the documentary to compensate for the stolen boat, thus securing the boys' freedom and their reunion with their families. Peter's plan was a resounding success. The compensation paid for the boat led to the boys' release and reunion with their families. Medical examinations revealed the ingenuity of their survival tactics, particularly the adeptly set and healed leg of Stephen, leaving him with nothing more than a scar and full mobility. The boys soon collaborated with Peter in creating the documentary, returning to Ata to film the reenactment of their survival story. Aired on Australian TV in 1966, the documentary was a sensation, catapulting Peter to hero status. His bravery and initiative earned him lobster capture rights in Tongan waters from King of Tonga, fulfilling his long-held ambition of becoming a successful fisherman. Peter's newfound privilege was also a boon for the boys. He hired them to crew his fishing boat, creating a symbiotic relationship that benefited all. Peter escaped the mundanity of accounting, while the boys found an exciting alternative to their boarding school routine. Together, they embarked on a new chapter, sailing the seas that once posed their greatest challenge, now the backdrop of their shared venture and newfound freedom. 
Thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate your time and hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked what you saw, be sure to check out the other great content on our channel. Your support means the world to us, and we can't wait to bring you more. Thank you again, and see you in the next video.